Great, thanks very much. I'm really happy to have the chance to um, share some of our lab's work with you today. And in fact, the topic I'm going to cover is really nicely related to what Dr. Keller uh, covered earlier. It's a uh, regards a question of identity, how cells acquire their specific identities, how those identities are maintained over time, whether cellular identities are relatively plastic and flexible, uh, depending on the circumstances, and, and how we might be able to harness those identities, um, as Dr. Keller was uh, discussing, for, for therapeutic means. So um, in our lab, we'd like to think about these questions of cellular identity uh, in the context of the heart. And in particular, um, today I'll focus on the, the question that you've already heard mentioned about how the ventricle, how the ventricular myocardium becomes distinct from the atrial myocardium. And of course, uh, these two kinds of myocardium, while they have a lot in common, it's readily apparent how distinct they are on a tissue level. You can see the difference in the thickness and the um, uh, texture of the tissues. On the cellular level, it's clear that these cardiomyocytes in the atrium and ventricle have unique attributes in terms of gene expression, in terms of their unique action potentials. Even the particular cellular morphology and subcellular structure are characteristic <clears throat> for ventricular and atrial cells. So we like to think about this question in the context of the zebrafish embryo. What is it that makes ventricular and atrial chambers distinct? Uh, in the zebrafish heart, in the embryonic heart, there's a very simple ventricular atrial layout. There's just one ventricular chamber, one atrial chamber, uh, they have the distinctions that I've described to you already in the context of the mammalian heart. And we typically use these markers to uh, distinguish the cell types, the ventricular myosin heavy chain VMHC and the atrial myosin heavy chain AMHC. In, in looking at where these two distinct cell types come from, we, we've been thinking about this question for a while, um, really with a focus on the origins of these lineages within the zebrafish. And through, through fate mapping studies, uh, we've previously shown that ventricular and atrial lineages separate very early. Uh, they're spatially organized, even prior to gastrulation, ventricular and atrial progenitors um, have a distinct spatial layout. Uh, that main, that Spatial organization is maintained as the cells gastrulate and come to reside in the heart fields. And actually, even before the heart tube forms, it's very clear that there are molecular distinctions between the ventricular and atrial myocardium. Uh, between this stage and this stage here, as the cells move toward the midline to begin to assemble the heart tube, during these stages, we can already see distinct gene expression programs in ventricular and atrial myocardium. So altogether, this indicates to us that these identities are established very early, that these cell types become distinct very early. Early. Um, and what I want to emphasize today is, is something that um, builds on that concept. Even though these cell types originate uh, in distinct lineages very early on, it turns out that their differentiation is really not locked in at those early stages. Uh, really, the theme I want to emphasize today is that these identities, while established early, need to be actively maintained over time. Even after we can see distinct ventricular and atrial cell types in the heart, there are still pathways that are active to make sure that those identities stay locked in, if you will. Uh, we first became aware of this uh, maintenance, this need for maintenance of chamber identity um, in the context of the zebrafish when we were looking at um, this mutant shown here, a mutation um, that disrupts the transcription factor gene NKX 2.5. And, and here in these mutants that we were really struck by the phenotype, instead of seeing a normally sized ventricle and atrium, in the NKX 2.5 mutants there's a really small ventricle and an enlarged atrium. And because we were so used to thinking about the early origins of these lineages, we first wondered whether this might represent a, a defect in specification, a problem in making enough ventricular progenitors and making too many atrial progenitors. But in fact, that's not the case. Specification seems completely normal in these mutants. And in fact, the initial heart tube has, has normal numbers of ventricular and atrial cells. Uh, we can count these cell types um, in the simple heart tube. There's really no difference in the number of atrial cells or ventricular cells in these NKX 2.5 mutants. Um, that's after one day of development when the simple heart tube has formed. But over the next day, between 24 and 48 hours of age, we see a change in these atrial and ventricular compartments. In fact, the embryos um, lose atrial cells, uh, sorry, lose ventricular cells and gain atrial cells over time. So you can see that here. Um, between 26 and 36 hours, there's an increase in atrial cells, a decrease in ventricular cells, even though the total cell number stays constant. You see the same here as we look out to uh, past two days of age. So there's a really interesting shift in these mutants over time. Although the ventricular and atrial lineages seem to be initially uh, set into place, um, over time there's a transition where ventricular cells are lost and atrial cells are gained. This 
this uh, transition is even more extreme when we look at the uh, shared functions of uh, NKX2.5 and another gene in the same family. There's another transcription factor called NKX2.7 um, that's very related to NKX2.5, expressed in the same areas as NKX2.5. And when we look at uh, embryos that are lacking both of these genes, we see a much more dramatic phenotype. So here in the NKX2.5 mutant, you can see the small ventricle, the large atrium, and even some atrial gene expression that's misplaced within the small ventricle. We take away one copy of 2.7, that phenotype becomes more enhanced. And in the double mutant, it's pretty much entirely an atrium. There's maybe a little shred, some remnant of ventricular tissue here. And again, this is a phenotype that develops over the second day of life. At one day in these embryos, there's a in the double mutant embryos, there's a completely normal looking ventricular portion of the heart tube and atrial portion of the heart tube. But over the next day, all of those ventricular cells change their gene expression. They even change, they even seem to change their location and come to occupy this enlarged atrium. So I won't, uh, these data were published a few years ago, so I won't take you through all of the data that, that demonstrate that point, but in essence what we've shown is happening when NKX gene function is lost is that ventricular cells are gradually shifting into what looks like an atrial identity. They downregulate ventricular genes, upregulate atrial genes, and even come to take residence within the atrium. So this was a really striking uh, phenomenon that made us aware of how important it is even after ventricular and atrial lineages appear different and are expressing different genes, how important it is to maintain, actively maintain, that ventricular identity. And the NKX genes seem to be a key part of that. Without NKX gene function, the ventricular cells will all um, lose that ventricular identity, and many of them at least will take on this atrial identity. So uh, we've been wondering, uh, this, this, uh, we're thinking about how to fit these NKX genes into a larger pathway. Uh, Kamara Targoff, who was previously a postdoc in the lab that did this work, she now has her own lab at Columbia University, and she's looking at what's downstream of NKX genes here, what's in that pathway that NKX genes drive to maintain ventricular identity. And we've been thinking about what's, what's upstream of NKX genes, what's uh, keeping the NKX genes on, what signals are acting above NKX, in order to maintain chamber identity in this context. And here, um, what I was interested to show you today is the role of the FGF pathway in that process. Uh, we were thinking about different signals. We were screening and evaluating different signaling pathways that might be involved in this maintenance role. And we were struck by the phenotype of FGF8 mutants, which although in, in, uh, in the beginning their ventricular um, compartment doesn't show this phenotype, over time, over that second day of life, they start to show evidence of atrial gene expression within the ventricle. We can see the same kind of um, problem in uh, keeping atrial gene expression out of the ventricle when we treat with uh, different strategies, when we use different strategies to block FGF signaling um, after ventricular differentiation has begun. So we begin these treatments at 18 hours post fertilization when ventricular and atrial gene expression patterns are already unique. And we find if we use a dominant negative FGF receptor or we use this FGF receptor antagonist, SU5402, the effects are the same, very reminiscent of what we see in the FGF8 mutants. We find a smaller ventricle, a larger atrium, as well as atrial gene expression misplaced within the ventricle. This is very reminiscent of what we see in uh, embryos that are lacking NKX gene function. Again, over, this, uh, over time, we see an increase in atrial gene expression, um, a loss of cells that lack atrial gene expression, yet the total number of cells remains quite constant. And again, we, we think that this is a very much a, a phenomenon of ventricular cells starting to exhibit atrial characteristics. Although initially, if we look at one of these hearts that we've treated with an FGF receptor antagonist, initially the ventricular and atrial compartments look just fine. In the ventricle, we see only VMHC and not AMHC. Over time, we start to see that those ventricular cells begin to express atrial genes like AMHC shown here. More and more cells, as time goes on, take on those atrial characteristics. They also start to downregulate ventricular genes during this time frame um, until later on it's really atrial genes that are most predominant in this tissue and ventricular genes are really diminished. So FGF signaling plays a really important role in preserving ventricular characteristics and we think that's definitely at least a large portion of what's happening when we um, block FGF signaling here is that cells in the ventricle are transforming into an atrial identity. Uh, but we did, to, to uh, look at the whole picture, we did consider other options for where these atrial cells, these atrial-like cells in the ventricle could be coming from. So for example, 
one idea we considered was the possibility that some of these ectopic AMHC expressing cells might actually be coming from the atrium uh, or from the atrioventricular region. I mean, there's some precedent for this, as it's uh, been shown by our colleague Neil Chi at UCSD, that injury of the ventricle in larval zebrafish can induce um, regeneration of the ventricle from a, a pool of atrial cells that under certain injury circumstances, some atrial cells can be triggered to move into the ventricle and change from atrial to ventricular identity. Um, so we wondered here if this treatment with uh, FGF antagonism was somehow inducing atrial cells to move into the ventricle and, and shift their identity somewhat. Uh, but in fact, we, we don't think that's what's happening here when we block FGF signaling. Here we've used a trace or um, a transgene that allows us to track AMHC expressing cells that are expressing this photoconvertible protein dendro. This is a, one of these photoconvertible fluorescent proteins that when first synthesized fluoresces green, but when exposed to UV light is irreversibly photoconverted to red, to red form. So you can expose embryos or areas of the embryo to light and then track red proteins from those locations. So for example, here we expose the atria um, expressing this transgene to UV light before we uh, treat with the, um, I'm sorry, right after we treat with the SU5402, but before the phenotype begins to emerge. And then we look to see if the atrial cells that emerge later are green or green and red. In the wild type, you can see that um, all of the cells that are expressing AMHC are in the atrium, and they're all green and red. These are all derived from cells that were expressing AMHC at the time of conversion. Um, but here in the SU5402 treated embryos, the cells that are, are in the atrium are indeed green and red, but the AMHC expressing cells that are in the ventricle are green but not red, indicating that they were not expressing <coughs> AMHC um, at the time of the photoconversion. So these AMHC expressing cells that we find in the ventricle are not derived from cells that were expressing AMHC initially. And we also considered uh, the intriguing possibility based on the location of these cells, that some of these ectopic AMHC cells could also be coming from outside of the heart. Uh, perhaps some of you are familiar with this aspect of, of ventricle development in which a good portion of the ventricle differentiate in early stage, but a later, at a later stage there's a, a subset of cells, late differentiating cells, and it's referred to as the second heart field, that migrate in and, and populate the upper part of the ventricle and the outflow tract. So we wondered whether some of these AMHC expressing cells, since they're located here at the top of the heart, could be cells that are contributed at a later stage. Uh, to evaluate this, we use some transgenes that can distinguish late differentiating from early differentiating cells. And just to um, uh, make the description of this uh, phenomenon uh, compact, I'll just direct you to um, the, the results here. In, in wild type, we find that among the late differentiating cell population, uh, which are all um, here not expressing this red transgene, this red transgene indicates the early differentiating cells, we don't see any AMHC cells, of course, in that late differentiating population in wild type. But in embryos that are treated with this FGF receptor antagonist, I'm showing you two examples here, we see both early and late differentiating cells that are expressing AMHC. So the little arrowheads show us cells that are green for this AMHC transgene, but not red. Um, these are cells that are late differentiating, but there are also cells that are green and red. Maybe you can see that more clearly here early differentiating cells that are also expressing AMHC. So it seems that FGF is crucial for enforcing ventricular identity in, in both sets of cells, uh, both sets of progenitor cells, both lineages that contribute to the ventricle, both early and late differentiating lineages. All of this is um, very much what we see in NKX 2.5 mutants, um, the fact that ventricular identity has trouble being maintained, that that's the case in both early and late differentiating populations. So we wondered whether indeed FGF signaling is acting upstream of NKX in this context. And in fact, in these, um, in these embryos, when we're inhibiting FGF signaling uh, after the differentiation has begun, we do see a reduction of expression of NKX 2.5 and also NKX 2.7, indicating the uh, positive effects of FGF on maintaining NKX gene expression in the tissue at this time. Moreover, when we ask whether we can rescue aspects of this phenotype by overexpressing or you know, pushing the expression of NKX genes in these embryos, we do see some modicum of rescue. Um, here's an example of the kind of ectopic AMHC expression we see when we treat with FGF receptor antagonists. When we do the same treatment in the context of a transgene that drives NKX 2.5 expression um, via heat shock, we can find um, a larger proportion of embryos that lack that ectopic expression of AMHC. Uh, but as you can see from the data here, this is really just a, a partial rescue. Um, without the transgene, 
most of the time, but not 100% of the time, we see these ectopic cells. With the transgene, there's just a little, um, uh, it's a, a small shift, a trend, although a statistically significant one. It doesn't represent an entire rescue of the phenotype, but a, a part of this story. So we think that NKX is one of the genes acting downstream of FGF that's important for maintaining ventricular identity, but uh, probably not the whole picture. So putting all of this together, uh, we think that FGF signaling plays a really important role in enforcing ventricular identities, both in early differentiating portions of the ventricle, in late differentiating portions of the ventricle, and that it works at least in part through NKX genes to repress atrial gene expression in the ventricle, promote um, ventricular gene expression in that location and keep those identities locked in. There must yet be other factors that, that also contribute downstream of FGF signaling, and we're really curious to find those going forward. I think looking at the bigger picture, a reason why we think this phenomenon is so important um, really relates back very closely to uh, the main points that Dr. Keller's talk was driving home. If an important goal, an important therapeutic goal of regenerative medicine is to create mature ventricular cardiomyocytes, it's also really important that those myocytes successfully maintain their identities. Uh, we know. Um, very clearly from uh, the points that Dr. Keller was raising, that we can push ventricular cells, we can push cells in the, into the ventricular lineage, we can push them in that direction. But it's clear from um, these sets of studies that it's not sufficient to just get them started on that path, but indeed they need to really be locked in and committed to that identity. I think this is an interesting question on a more global level. What does it mean to be committed to an identity? We don't really know this very well, I think, for for very many cell types. And, and I really hope that using this model, uh, we can learn more not only about what it takes to commit to a ventricular lineage, but what it means to go from um, starting on that differentiation path to really locking into it. And that's where we hope the work will go in the future. Um, in closing, I'll just acknowledge the contributors to this story. Uh, the NKX work that I've shown you is the work of Kimara Targoff, who now has her own lab at Columbia. Um, and the FGF story was the graduate thesis of Arjuna Pradhan, uh, who's now working at Amgen. She's graduated and is an Amgen employee now, um, with con contributions from other current and former lab members, as well as our collaborators. Uh, thanks for your attention.